All right, if you all are ready to roll, I am. <clears throat> so here we go. Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are so glad you are here with us. And just by showing up, you are already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, I am thrilled to present two of my heroes from the world of music, one from the creative side, the other from the business side. The pairing represents a high watermark for this series as we present one of the most decorated musical creators of the last 40 years and member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Stuart Copeland. And joining him is the music industry's global ambassador of goodwill, Ralph Simon. More on these two icons in just a moment. Before we get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, say hello to your friends, and make some new ones, and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during today's session. Also, please make sure your chat is set to address speakers and attendees. I want to thank our sponsors for without their help, we couldn't make this free. First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, the Fairlane Hotel, Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and Cushmasters brand of CBD products. So let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome back my good friend and collaborator, Ralph Simon. Ralph has enjoyed a spectacular 30 plus year history in, in a variety of prominent fields the music industry visionary who co-founded major indie leader Zamba and Jive Records, signed talent, grew a globally successful music publishing company, managed some of the world's top record producers, was EVP at Capitol Records and Blue Note, and foresaw, foresaw the potential of mobile phones and social media very early on. One of the founders of the global mobile entertainment and mobile social media industry and popularly known as the father of the ringtone. He has consistently been at the forefront of mobile media innovation, mobile learning and social media ideation, next steps AI, mobile video, and engaging with global digital business leaders and political innovators across the cultures around the world. His reputation as a distinguished interviewer and moderator in the US and around the world with a captivating interviewing style and consistently attracts plaudits. He correctly predicted that the future belongs to screenagers everywhere, everywhere who run their social media lives through music, streaming, and connecting on their mobile phones. He's currently developing an exciting new music series for TV and social media called The Virtuosos. He's responsible for curating and programming some of the world's most important startup and future of music and tech gatherings worldwide and as co-founder and chairman of Mobilium Global, the international cool hunters and startup investors. Based in London, Ralph maintains long-standing links in the US and globally. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in the UK and member of the Recording Academy in the US. Welcome back, Ralph. Hi there, Tom. And joining Ralph as today's special guest is one of my musical heroes and someone who has delivered some of the most iconic sounds of my youth, Stuart Copeland. Stuart has spent more than three decades at the forefront of contemporary music as rock star and acclaimed film composer, as well as the disparate worlds of opera, ballet, and world and chamber music. Recruiting Sting and Andy Summers in 1977, Stuart renowned as the founder of The Police, a band that became a defining force in rock music from the 1980s through to the present day. But his work with the police is just a small sample of his creative genius. Stewart moved beyond the rock arena in the mid 80s when he returned to his classical roots and created pursuits in concert and film music. His concert works include Tyrant's Crush, Concerto for Trap Set and Orchestra commissioned by the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, 
Poltroons in Paradise, commissioned by the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, and Gameland de Drum, commissioned by the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, among others. Stewart has also written operas based on the stories of Edgar Allan Poe, called The Cask of Amontillado, and Telltale Heart, as well as the Surreal Chamber opera, The Invention of Morel. Stewart has continued writing for opera, works such as Electric Saint, commissioned by Stalis Capel Weimer, sorry about that, Stuart, as well as Ontario uh, Oratio, Satan's Fall, based on John Milton's Paradise Lost. Recipient of the Hollywood Film Festival's Most Outstanding Music and Film Visionary Award, a Grammy nominee for Orchestrale in 2005, and a 2003 inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Copeland has been responsible for some of the, of the film world's most innovative and groundbreaking scores. His numerous film scores include Oliver Stone's Wall Street, the Golden Globe nominated soundtrack for Francis, Francis Ford Coppola's Rumblefish, the Oscar nominated Four Days in September as well. His work in television includes contribution, contributions to The Equalizer, Babylon 5, and Desperate Housewives. He also scored the blockbuster hit video game Spyro. His career includes the sale of more than 60 million records worldwide and numerous awards, including five Grammys. Please welcome these two icons of music to today's smartest people in the room. Take it away, Ralph. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Tom. And uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, in, you are all the smartest people in the room for coming to join today. Stuart, great, great welcome to you in your studio in Los Angeles. Great to see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. You know, Ralph, I never realized until just now the full extent of how cool we both are. <laughs> Half right. of that stuff, I don't. Wow, that's right. Yeah, cool, cool. No, that's it's fantastic to see you, and of course, just for to see you surrounded by that instrumentation and um, all of the tools of your trade, uh, including I can see some interesting Oriental and uh, Asian uh, instrumentation there, but. Just great. Yeah, you got your Balinese, you got your African, you got your Japanese, that's the drums. Right. <laughs> that's right. Traditional wow. uh, Japanese drum set from Fantastic. Tama. Fantastic. And you're the guy that's famous for using 18 cymbals in your drum setup, right? I don't know. Give me a minute. I'll go count them. Oh, very good. I may have, I may have dropped a few by now. I'm not, you know, yeah. like when I was young, 18, 19, I could handle it. But now... I've slowed down a little, you know, maybe I got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's, you know. You're slipping, man. Yeah. Well, Stuart, uh, well, let me just say, uh, I'm in London. Tom Truitt is in Nashville. We've got this trinity of cities, Nashville, LA, London, bringing together what we hope will be a very interesting pathway through not just your career, but what stimulates you in terms of your new creativity, there are a number of new projects that you're doing that are both interesting, absorbing, unusual, original. And we really want to tap into what drives that muse in you to amuse people around the world. Well, primarily, the, the, the first beneficiary of all this work is your humble servant. You know, it's like I make model airplanes for a living. And, uh, you know, my wife does all the work around here, you know, dealing with the plumber, the lawyer's life and all of its complexities. And my work, darling, I must return to my work, by which I mean, you know, writing a scene of opera or maybe, you know, agonizing, agonizing, tortuous. How? Oh, Lord, how shall I deal with this cello line? Such miseries right. are my daily life. Well, Stuart, what I wanted to do was just to give those that are not familiar with uh, some of the details of your own pathway. You were born in Alexandria. That's not in Egypt. That's Alexandria in Virginia. When you're a young yes. kid, you move uh, with a family to Cairo in Egypt. You then move to Beirut in Lebanon. And that's when you start getting into your own musical experimentation, hearing a lot of Middle Eastern music, a lot of Lebanese music. And then gradually the family moves back to London uh, or you move to London where uh, you go to school. You go to school in Somerset in England. And um, 
uh, at that stage, had you at, uh, at high school started playing uh, drums and playing in a band at high school? Well, actually, I did play drums at the American Community School in Beirut uh, at the age of 12. We were called the Black Knights. Um, and we played the American Beach Club and the British uh, Beach Club, uh, even back at that early age. Wow. And so, so this passion that you had for percussion, uh, percussion passion. Is Banging really stuff. Different. I mean, you know, enough said. In the drum. And, well, uh, I, okay, um, my, my personal uh, story is that uh, I was a late bloomer, uh, a skinny, right. undernourished uh, kid. Um, and the first time I actually hit a drum, suddenly, instantaneously, I am now an 800 pound silverback. Just instant adult masculinity derived from the sheer volume, the aggression. I may be a skinny little piece of puke, but check this out. This is all dope for a 12 year old. Absolutely. And it's right. becoming yeah. more, actually, now that I'm 60 something, uh, it, it still kind of has resonance, even more perhaps. Well, so when, you, when you're around 25 years old, 1977, you become the founding uh, glue, I guess you can say, of the band that uh, uh, brought in a guitarist called Henry Padovani, a British guy, and Sting. And of course, Henry was then replaced by Andy Summers. And that was the time in the British uh, the punk movement, in a sense, where you basically put together what was this trio and this grouping that came together. And then, of course, over the next many, many years, uh, you developed a career that not only was involved in producing some of the most memorable music, but you were also with a record company called A&M, which is named after Herb Alpert, A, Jerry Moss, M. And it was always a label known for really nurturing the creative um, sensibilities of the talent they worked with, as well as doing things in a really tasteful way. But you were signed to the British company, not necessarily the American company. Is that right? Yes. In fact, they signed this obscure artist called Clark Kent. Um, just who, by some fluke, was actually having a hit. The, the record came out on Krypton Records in green vinyl. And nobody even knew who this Clark Kent guy was. He had like this disguise. I mean, nobody, he had an American accent. He was in London, obviously extremely talented. Um, extreme. But he started to get airplay, got on the radio. And so a and quickly picked up this independent label artist and picked him up and signed the artist. And he seemed to also have this band, so screw it, let's sign them too. And then Sting wrote Roxanne. Right, so um, you recorded that uh, particular recording in the countryside in Surrey in England, if my memory serves me correctly. Yes, that's right, at Surrey and Sound Studios, where we recorded our first two police albums, in fact. Uh, exactly. we, would, we would record, we'd get the graveyard shift, we'd work at night because the big bands who actually had a recording budget you know, Kevin Godley and Lol Cream, you know, they were our superiors. They'd be in there in the day. And then we, when they'd finished, we'd sneak in at night. And actually we bonded with, with, with uh, our, our betters um, and they've become lifelong friends, but we kind of shared that studio for a period. So one of the things that characterized that early evolution of the way the, music, the musical texture of the band developed was it was always said that the band and you from a rhythmic point of view was somewhat taken by the sound and the feel of reggae. And in a sense, Roxanne, which was such a signal track for yourselves, had that kind of feel that blended a rock feel with a reggae feel. Just give us a sense historically of what drew you to that rhythmic feel on Roxanne. Well, uh, when I was in college in Berkeley, California, I got to the radio, I got into the radio station, KALX, and I became a, one of the boss jocks on the wow. boss station playing the boss records that my boss told me to play. Uh, <laughs> that was my radio gag. Um, yeah. And uh, but I was the English guy. I played the music from England because I had been to England. So I so stuff came in. For some reason, one of the records came in from England was Bob Marley and the Whalers. Wow. And whoa, that just kind of changed everything. Um, and why so that? I, why was that? Why were why did that rhythmic feel, which was different to say 
the rock feel or different to say an American feel that you would have got at the University of California, Berkeley. How, how did that just seep into you? Well, I think it probably hit me the way it hit everybody else, which particularly drummers was, wait a minute, that's all wrong. Let me, let me, how do you do that? And when you listen to reggae as a rock drummer, uh, and all, I'm sure all my buddies had the same experience. Wait a minute, the backbeat there, you know, the kick is landing on three and not, That's it. and then the backbeat lands at the same time as the, the kick drum. This is just all you know, back to front, bass backwards. Right. And so it's very startling. However, I had an advantage in picking up this attitude towards rhythm. And by the way, uh, the reason why this is so revolutionary is because rock music, jazz music, funk, soul, everything, all forms of popular music this century feature the backbeat, have the same rhythmic structure from Miles Davis to the Sex Pistols. It's the same 4-4 rhythm with a backbeat. And so mm -hmm. reggae was the first form of music to totally break that mold and just uh, completely upside down. And Miles Davis and, and, and the Sex Pistols have more in common rhythmically than either of them have with reggae. But the other thing about reggae that maybe it resonated with me personally was that it shares a rhythmic um, building block, a, some, some DNA, accidental DNA with the music that I grew up with, which was Arabic music. Now, yeah. Arabic music, or as they describe it, the, the baladi rhythms, which means country rhythms. Mm, da, ja, mm, da, da, ja, mm, da. Okay, it features the heavy beat of the bar is on three, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, and, and it's all up, and there's no one. You know, two, three, four, <gasps> two, three, four, nothing, two, three, four. These are the same format, the same rhythmic equation as reggae. Two, two, two three, four, nothing, two, three, four, <gasps> two, three, four. And the up chick, jack, 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 jack. So the Arabic rhythm, which I wasn't even paying that much attention to when I was nine, just, you know, I, I, I was there immersed in it until the age of 15, just by osmosis, it came and corrupted my DNA. So that when I heard <laughs> reggae landing on three, hey, I know how that works. It was just part of the natural thing. So actually what people often, uh, have identified as a Caribbean flavor to the police's music actually comes from Beirut, Lebanon. How fascinating. Really interesting that there'd be that link between the Jamaican feel and the Lebanese feel. And also when you look at the, the British experience where it was really Toots and the Maytals, the famous reggae group, even before Bob Marley exploded in that part of the world and then globally, that started setting the tone, of course, many, many uh, Anglo-Caribbean uh, 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 immigrants into the UK that also helped to foster that reggae uh, feel and sound. But Roxanne... Well, there was another thing, which was that the, the other play, way that reggae came into rock music in a, by another thing, I mean, obviously Bob Martin, the first one for me was Desmond Decker and the Israelites. That was the first time I heard that rhythm and was immediately intoxicated by it. But another strange historical phenomenon occurred, which is that in London in the 1977, the year of the birth of punk, and all these yeah. punk clubs, the music was this loud, hostile, expressing the rage of the young Londoner or English That's person that. in Manchester or wherever. And it was all about rage and energy. Problem is that when you're in a club all night with all that rage, you, you know, even punk right rockers have got to chill. But there's no chill punk music. There isn't any. That's just not, you know. So the DJ, in fact, one in particular, Don Letts, would play dub reggae, which was chill, but suitably hostile. It suitably desired to eat your children and burn down the world <laughs> while chilling. And wow. so that was something that all punk rockers were introduced to by pretty much by Don Letts and, and other DJs. And so we, we kind of heard that stuff. And I think it was The Clash uh, were the first skinny white English band to say, hey, let's, let's see if we can do that. And uh, Topper Heaton, I'm sure sat, you know, like, and he can't, just like I did, counting it out, two, three, four, what, what? No, that can't be. One more time, two, three, four, really? Okay, and, and he did it quite, you know, quite convincing. There was a really good, good clash tune. I think was the first time I ever heard 
white punk reggae. Um, mm-hmm. But then again, I had my secret sauce, which was that okay. Arabic stuff. And so when I copped right onto that, um, but did my own kind of version with it, um, I was not the first. It must be said. Topper Heaton. So big Stuart, on you, dude. Obviously, uh, special props to Topper Heaton and, of course, to uh, Joe Strummer, the brilliant, late, great Joe Strummer. But just trying to get a sense, while you were constructing that material, do you think the fact that you were a three-piece band um, helped you use that kind of rhythmic structure so that you'd fill in the spaces to make up for perhaps a bigger instrumentation in the group? Well, one very cool thing about reggae, more so than in most other kinds of music, is the interdependence of the elements. Doesn't mean, unless you have that up chick, and that bass line doesn't do what that bass line is supposed to do unless you have that guitar doing the thing, unless you have the, 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 the snare, you know, none of it works until those three elements are in play. Whereas mm-hmm. rock and roll, do do da da do do da da do do, you know, it's it kind of still works. It still is what it is on mm-hmm. you know on just the guitar or whatever. But mm-hmm. reggae is much more. The elements are more interdependent, more codependent, and uh, so for a three piece, that is very rewarding. And it also does require a real extra brilliance from your guitarist. Not, let's forget about the bass guitar just for a moment, but. Andy oh Stone. shoot! Let's forget about the bass guitar for a moment and let's talk. <laughs> yeah, the guy who wrote all of our hits. Yeah, sure, sure. That's right. That's right. Now uh, we will come back to that in a minute. But Andy and his consummate skill and his breadth as a player really melded in well with this rhythmic form that you were kind of really pioneering in a sense in the modern punk meets rock era. Well, he also ha. Uh, uniquely among guitarists. In fact, he was the first guy I ever heard who knew when to not play. There were times when Andy would fill up the sound like a symphony orchestra with no discernible rhythm. Just the kind of waft of that harmonic voicing that he had incredible gift for voicing and using the six strings of a guitar to create chords of amazing intoxicating complexity while not even going jung 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 just war you know so he didn't actually even have to play that thing he would just create cool stuff on it he was very much uh you know he could play burning solos weedly 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 he could do that all night but there was something that he did that nobody else could do which was create a symphonic envelope around the funky bass line and rather cool drums wow and so you make the uh, album in that in at Surrey Sound Studios. The Roxanne comes out. It's a massive hit all over the world. The band really gets going. You're on this whole new uh, wind brought about by the whole new movement, whether it's the skinny tie movement or the punk movement or whatever it is. But because of your strong American background and the feel for American music, Sting, of course, uh, uh, being such a great bass player and being able to really drive the feel and the unusual vocal timbre that he had. Um, h- how did you bring your rhythms into the actual recordings? If you can think of some of the police's hits where your rhythmic structures played a kind of formative role in the structure of the song, can you perhaps think of any that fall into that category? Well, I can tell you one thing was that none of it had any kind of strategy or consideration or pre-planning or composition. You know, one of my best buddies, Neil Pert, was famous, the doctor. Oh, is like his, yeah. his, his stuff was composed. Uh, well, I do a lot of composing myself, but that's for the orcs, the orchestra. Like when it comes to actually playing the drums, uh, who, what, where, what, bang, bazooba, bazanga, it's all entirely instinct. No thought goes into any of it. But in fact, the um, police recordings, the drums on those police records um, was all completely spontaneous. It, the, the system we had was that Sting, clever old Sting, would reveal his mighty songs on an as-needed basis. So, oh, really? you know, us, Andy and I would show up for the album, here, here, listen to all 10 of my songs. And, you know, after the first couple, it's like, you know, you've lost the room, you know. So Sting was very clever. 
he would only introduce a song when it was needed. And we're all going, okay, what should we do now? I said, I've got a song. And we knew, okay, yeah, but yes, please. Um, so Andy and Sting would put their heads together and they would obsess over the, over the, the, the riff, the voicing, and Andy would you know, take the voicing and do his thing with it. And they'd have their heads together for maybe half an hour just to figure out, okay, verse, chorus, bridge in A, and then we go to F sharp minor and, you know, and uh, Greek to me, uh, but uh, they would work it out. And then we go, okay, let's do a take. And we sit there, we do like two or three takes. Usually we'd end up on take two, but now I first heard the song half an hour ago before doing take two. And take two is what I'm stuck with for eternity. Those recordings were completely much off the cuff. It's on the record forever. Right. Amazing. So, for example, every breath you take, or or, uh, or don't okay, stand so now close you to... every breath you take is a different animal. Every every breath you exactly. take was every drum was an its own overdub, carefully considered, fully composed. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, where's the right drum for that exact boom? Uh, uh, all day obsessing. Over. Okay, the backbeat. Bot, bot, which was, was a gong drum and a snare drum together. Every uh -huh. out, okay, the cymbals, ting, 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 where every piece of it was layered on different, entirely not organically, and was our biggest hit. So there you go. Some of my Ever favorite, you know, message in a bottle was three guys slamming it out. You know, uh, every little thing she does is magic, is just like blazing away there. But um, right. um, every breath you take was carefully honed. Takes a lot of work to make it that simple. It does. It is. It's carefully prepared spontaneity to make it real simple. Absolutely uh -huh. correct. Um, so, and Stuart, we, when you started touring, uh, when did you feel that you were really on this wave? And of course, it was uh, your brother Miles's uh, strategy to make sure that you toured to as, in as many international countries as was possible, and you would go and play. Uh, you get if, if you were invited to open an envelope you'd go and open it you would do you'd play anywhere was that because there was a natural sense of international uh, adventure with the band well every band i think is really optimistic or they wouldn't do it and right. you know you ask you know you too did you ever think you were going to make it yes you ask the band you never heard of do you think you're going to make it? Yes, because you wouldn't do it. So bands mutually together, they're kind of like a mutual optimism society um, as they're stabbing each other in the back. Uh, no, bands are generally know they're going to make it, whether they are going to or not. And so right. our first feeling of that we rule was way back when we were an opening act for Cherry Vanilla at the, you know, at whatever club in Cardiff, Wales. Um, right. Uh, so, or Rebecca's in Birmingham, we thought, this is it, we're on the roll now, we're on our way to the stars, uh, and you feel that every step of the way, and one day right. you look around, and okay, you are playing Shea Stadium, um, yeah. but it's all incremental, you don't really, you know, there, are, occasionally there's a step up that you kind of notice you've had an upgrade, our first arena, for instance, was, was really different, you know, because you play theaters, you play clubs, then you play theaters, and the biggest theaters, like, 3,000 or something, and then the, the smallest arena is like 18,000. So that's a big jump, you notice that. And also the environment on stage is very, very different from a theater where you have wings on the side and everything. On an arena, there's nothing, empty space, all of the people are behind you. Um, and it's a very different feeling and the audience is much further away. And so it's actually quite, that, that, that was the time of noticing, hey, we just, we just went up. Actually, no, I will share with your viewers another cheerful moment when we got a feeling of an upgrade. Okay, yesterday we were that, today we are this. Right. Cool. Which was the day we were touring in, uh, in America and we were in New York City and right. we got a telephone call. Um, boys, the money is hit. You've had a hit record now and you are now three very wealthy young men. Wow. Have a nice day. Huh. And we did have a nice day. Uh, we went straight down to 47th Street, uh, Manny's Music Store, which is a huge, huge uh, music store with everything. We bought everything in the store in triplicate, you know, 
Sting sees a Fender Stratocaster. Cool, I'll take one too. In fact, there it is. That's the Stratocaster right there. In fact, this is the Roland. That's the, you know, we bought half the store and, uh, and loaded it all into a truck. We had a show that night on Long Island at a place called My Father's Place. There was the sound check from hell with the echoes and the new amps and new guitars and clang, bang, crash. And uh, they got their Moog foot pedals and everything. We were just like up the wazoo with our toys. That was a fun day. Stuart, here's a question for you. When you're playing those big stadiums, as a drummer, do you have to moderate your modulation of your playing? Or how do you, how does your style change when you're in a such a huge uh, arena environment? Well, um, the arena is the big upgrade. The stadium is once again exponentially bigger, but the yeah. feeling on stage isn't that different. You're, it's, you're in an open space, uh, quite distant from the audience. There's a lot of them, so you know they're there. Um, so there is a different thing. You know, it's easier to play a stadium for 80,000 people in terms of nervosity than it is to play your high school dance or to play at your best friend's wedding. There, you are not the supernova. <laughs> you know, when you're in a stadium, you walk out and it's all easy. You know, you know whatever you do is the footsteps of the mighty gods. Uh, but so playing big gigs is actually easier than playing little gigs. Go figure. Amazing. Um, so, Stuart, um, we want to move on to your post-police uh, career, particularly because um, you started doing some really interesting things. I mean, for example, in 1986, you recorded with Peter Gabriel on his album So and on a track called Red Rain because he loved your mastery of the hi-hat. Give us a little bit of a sense of whether that started triggering your desire to do stuff that was more... Um, more broad musically, and then also want to try and get a sense of how on earth you managed to educate and inculcate yourself into working with orchestras, orchestral pieces, symphony orchestras, philharmonia. Just give us some sense from Peter Gabriel onwards. Let's see, I will take you yes, on a journey from mastery of the 16th notes to mastery of the woodwinds. Uh, oh. Sounded great, didn't it? Uh, no, I mean, I guess Peter called me up because one of the things about reggae, another thing is that those 16th notes are a very much part of the, the effervescence is part of the language of reggae. The reggae drummer is doing fills and riffs all the way through. He never shuts up. Nobody ever says, hey, look, we're trying to play a song here. Uh, the reggae drummer just fills it all up. And those 16th notes are very much a part of the vocabulary. So I copped as much of that as humanly possible. And Mr. Gabriel noticed that I'd figured out some cool, interesting twists on what you can do. And for your listeners who are not musicians, uh, you got your four on the floor. One, two, three, four. In between the quarter notes are the eighth notes. One and two and three and four. Or, or uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In between those is the persnickety wow. shit. The 16th notes. Dugga, 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 dugga. My world. And so um, uh, Pete call, Peter called up and brought me over just to, 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 to do, because you can supply that usually with a hi-hat or ride cymbal. Peter wanted something, not those two things. Can you, have you got anything else? And so I had some other ideas. And so um, it was a strange recording experience because there was uh, Tony Levin in there, Mondo bass player, and Peter kind of hitting chords on the piano, but no song, no lyrics, no nothing, nothing identifiable as a song, just kind of atmospheres with lots of 16th notes um, and kind of grooves. And I had a fun day. He's a very entertaining, uh, gracious man. Peter Gabriel is uh, recording uh, out in Bath, um, uh, Bath, Somerset in England, very pretty part of the world. Wonderful, wonderful day. And um, then the record came out like two years later. And in fact, I got two platinum albums um, were awarded to me for my work on that album. I couldn't tell you which track I played on. No idea. 
Yeah, when I brain. was in the room with them, I didn't hear any of the lyrics. He hadn't even oh, written the oh, lyrics yet. Exactly. So all oh, I heard was just a bit of a waft and a bit of a this. And when the album comes out, and I, I think that might be me in there. The 16th notes are very cool. Must be me. But I, but the drummer very often doesn't even hear the, the song because right. this isn't so much true today because of drum boxes and drums can be also can be done as an overdub. But back in the day, you had to record the drums first and the singer might not even be in the room. They're not even thinking about that. They're thinking about getting that rhythmic building blocks, that, that, that structure, that foundation. Right. And so that's particularly was true with Peter Gabriel where I'm just the drummer around here. I have no idea what song is going to go on. To. I believe the song was called Red Rain. That's it. Those it are is. my 16th notes on Red Rain. Oh, well, now, well, now we know it. We'll, we'll immediately look it up on uh, and get Spotify to play it after the session. Here's another thing. Around about that time, you form a band called Animal Logic with Stanley Clark, the jazz bassist, and with Deborah Holland, who's a singer-songwriter. And interestingly enough, we've got a question from... Rick Olson, who sent a question in, he played in the band Berlin, and he knew about the work that you did uh, with Animal Logic. In fact, he opened for you as the opening act, Berlin, when you played at uh, Hollywood Park. So it's just interesting, Animal Logic, um, Stanley Clark, this was part of a move that you were starting to make into expanding your musical versatility. Give us a sense of how you started the orchestral thinking. Well, actually, Animal Logic was kind of the other, the traffic was going in the opposite direction. Uh -huh. Whereas Stanley and I met and bonded and said, we should do something. We, we got it. This, this works great. Let's find us a singer songwriter. And we found Deborah Holland, um, which was, right. we thought, we, you know, rather than sneer at pop music, let's make some. You know, if it's so easy, right. you know, let's make some. Let's, you know, so we found, you know, we, we found Deborah Holland and her songs, who was like brainy, brainy woman rather than hot babe. And we thought that would be an interesting take that, you know, she has things to say that aren't being said by, you know, hot babes, um, a thinking woman. That, that was kind of, a, you know, and, and her songs are very interesting. However, right at that moment, both Stanley and I suddenly, coincidentally, got very popular as film composers. And suddenly I, I got Oliver Stone calling, says he wants me to score a movie. Uh, hang on, guys, I'll just take care. I'll be back in, uh, by the time I finish that, Stanley's on a huge movie. And suddenly we both became film composers, leaving the record company and Deborah Holland kind of in the lurch. But the film composing is what took me to orchestral music. Um, and it happened on my first job as a film composer, which is for Francis Ford Coppola. Um, right. and he hired me to do out stuff. So that's no problem. I can do that. And he was very much enjoying the weirdness, uh, and strangeness of the music that I was making, but he, as a filmmaker, and he's, you know, you got to break people's hearts. You got to make people feel stuff. All this kind of caustic abrasive stuff is intellectually stimulating, but I want my audience to feel. So give me some strings, right? Strings. Uh, Sure, Francis, string. You want strings? <laughs> Shoot, if I don't get on this real quick, he's gonna hire some guy to put some strings on my music. Francis, you want strings? I won't get you some strings. So I call up the contractor. Strings, I want strings. He says, well, okay, how many strings? I don't know, strings, string, many, more, more than one, string, plural. Um, and so I got like maybe 12 men and women came down. Now, in the, when you're recording, in my world, recording, you get the guitarist, you book the afternoon, he shows up with his, with his crew and they set up, he's got his 15 Les Pauls, 20 Stratocasters, foot pedals from here to there, just in case you might, you need a little bit more fuss on him, let me grab the 68, you know. And uh, so you spend the afternoon bonding and exchanging ideas and it's mutual inspiration with the guitar. It's a great way to spend an afternoon. However, when the string players come in, these are a different, hitherto unknown to me, form of musician, which is musicians of the eye. You don't tell them what to play. You put a sheet of music in front of them and they play that exactly. And to the extent that you put their instructions on the page in whatever detail, that's what they will play. 
And I didn't have any idea about that. These guys come in, there's all 12 of them. I'm a little intimidated. And I'd had, um, I'd played the chords out and uh, I could remember from college was the last time I saw a sheet of music was when I was in college and hadn't had a whole career in music without ever seeing a sheet of music. Now, hey, wow. the lines, F, A, C, E. I sort of remember how that works. And it was all footballs anyway, just whole notes. Yeah, yeah. Really, you know, I didn't have, I didn't know how to use strings anymore than just have them swaying beautiful stuff back and forth. So they come in and I start on them as I would with a guitarist, you know, hey guys, great, great to meet you all. It's great to have you here. Now we got the scene and we kind of got this atmosphere where, and I start telling them about, them about the scene and how, you know, when you, when, cause with the, the, the screen with the movie being playing on, okay, when he looks at the girl, it needs to have kind of a, you know, and instead of them looking like a guitarist, oh, cool, I, I got you, man, I got you, man. I think, unless Paul, yeah, I think, you know, they're looking more and more anxious. Yeah. And eventually one of them says, uh, maestro, maestro, um, do you want us to play what's on the page here or whatever the hell you're talking about? Okay, play the page. And they played it just like that. They were done. No afternoon of talking about which pickups he should, maybe use the front pickup, roll a little treble, you know, none of that. They play it and they're done in 20 minutes. Done. Couple things. First of all, they're done in 20 minutes. Second of all, wow that's really pretty and so began another four decades of playing with orchestras so where you hadn't written music before how were you able to convey your compositional sensibility to the, the brass section the woodwind section and so forth did you then get an arranger to write who would sit with you before the session and then put it all together well, that first uh, Rumblefist session, I was very blessed at that time. My drum tech was actually a graduate, of Ju a graduate of Juilliard School of Music, name of Jeff Seitz. And he was there. Uh -huh. And I had these chords because I, I, the good Lord did not give me piano tune. So that first chord, I, it's that note, that, that, okay, okay, roll tape. Dun, 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 Okay, stop. Okay, the next chord is that one gang okay okay roll tape drop me in a bar six and 17 then gang 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 you know and I, I you know but i did know those notes and so i could put those notes as footballs you know one bar of this followed by another bar of that was just, yeah yeah pretty easy so between jeff and i we figured out the charts then as i got into more complex film scoring and i needed woodwinds and other orchestral events, I just, I, I would do it on a computer. Then they, well, by the way, then they invented computers. Rumblefish, right. they didn't have computers. Uh, yeah. In fact, I did use a scoring computer. It was a very sophisticated piece of technology, which was just tell me what tempo from this shot here, symphony number this, to that shot there, symphony number that, what BPM will make me land right on the time when she looks at Rusty James and, you know, and, you know, the, or the, the car hits the building or whatever, you know. That was so they invented computers on which I could actually write more complex material because I can't actually play it. I can conceive of it and enter it in, but I can't actually these fingers, you know. So then I started to hire guys who would arrange it for me. And I would get my session and I'd have it sounding great on my my fake orchestra because I could tweak it and I could hone it and I could have it swell and I could do all the stuff. But then the real orchestra would come in on my big orchestra date. Now now I'm feeling like Mozart or something. I gotta. Yeah, actual music. Um, and it didn't sound as good. It was just like, da, 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 da. And I said, well, how come it doesn't go? Da, 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 Well, you've got to yeah. put little cool stuff on there. You got to put your articulations. You got to put your Italian. You got to put your hairpins. And so as I kind of, okay, the, the, I, my arrangers would give me the score and I'd get to the session and it's not, it's not, yow. And so I said, well, can I, is it, a, can I, can I like put a, a hairpin on that just to make it so that, hey, maestro, you can do what the hell you want. <laughs> you don't say. So I got more and more into these scores and messing them up and jazzing them up more and more. And eventually I finally called USC and said, who's your orchestration boss? And oh, uh, I got a guy called it. Chris Rose who came over here and kicked my ass every Friday. 
And uh, wow. by then I was getting commissioned to write symphonies for the Dallas Symphony or the Liverpool Philharmonic or whatever. Yeah. And I need, and I kind of want it to be sort of professional. And so I'd have, you know, I actually learned and, he would, and I'd show him my score and he'd come back just a sea of red ink. No, the brass players, you need to, you know, if you have him play up here, he can hit that note, but he's going to be busting. You can't have him sweet and sexy there. If you want that note, use your, your other instrument, you know, all this stuff, the, 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 the technique of not only how the instruments are best used to best advantage, but also to put on the page the language that they understand you know, so that melody isn't da 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 is da 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 da, which is actually written slightly differently for the strings. You would get that effect on the strings with slightly different articulation for all this stuff back and forth with Mr. Rose and beating me up. Um, actually, I've got a new teacher now, Dr. Deborah Lynn, uh, uh -huh. University of Manchester in Indiana, is actually my new mentor and uh, guide because she's more into opera, which is what I do now. Now I'm into opera, which is the human voice, which is another world of pain. Well, we want to talk about this uh, operatic involvement you've got, but also to talk about some of the things you've been doing in the last couple of years, particularly, I mean, just uh, uh, last in 2020, you did your first podcast, My Dad the Spy, obviously about your father's former career. And uh, we haven't really spoken about your brothers very much, Miles, who managed you, and your late brother, Ian, who died a very untimely death. He was your agent in those early years. But um, just want to talk about some of the television that you've done, because uh, with, the, with your knowledge of the UK, you started doing stuff first with Discovery in the US, a series called Stuart Travel Series with Discovery. We want you to tell us a little bit about. Then you did Stuart Copeland's Adventures in Music, which the BBC in the UK and globally put out in January of 2020. And um, then uh, in February 2020, you did Stuart Copeland on drums. Tell us just a little bit about each of those TV adventures that you did. Well, uh, I've always enjoyed travel. And I always enjoyed, um, my mind's gone blank. The, the greatest travel show guy on earth who died recently. You know who I'm talking about. My mind's gone blank. But I, the idea of a travel show about music always appealed to me. And so oh, right. Discovery Channel, bless them, gave me an opportunity to go to Bali and test this theory out. And oh, I discovered wow. something very useful by going yeah. and taking like a huge film crew to Bali to do Bali. Um, I realized that just because I like it doesn't mean everyone else does. If I had gone to Rio or to Paris or anywhere normal, the show would have gotten a following, but I went to Bali, which is a lot of banging and clashing and bells. And you, <laughs> it's a limited market. But I think uh, Discovery went a little cross-eyed yeah. um, and it didn't work out. But the BBC, however, much more discerning, they yeah. hired me to do, um, to present a show about drums, to go and figure out, they, they did bass and they got Tina Weymouth and guitar, uh, I'm going crazy here to remember which guitarist it was, but, um, and it was on, on drums, on guitar, and on, on bass. Right. Then I got to do the drums one, which was cool. I got to go talk to all my buddies, Taylor Hawkins, and I found some fascinating stuff. For instance, yeah. that the drum set, we were earlier talking about how the backbeat has dominated music for the, and in more than a century, 120 right. years. Right. Why is that? Well, because the drum set, my instrument was ended, invented by, um, um, in New Orleans in, in 1898. Wow. Uh, by D.D. Chandler. And uh, he was the guy who invented the most important invention of the century, which was the bass drum pedal, the humble bass uh -huh. drum pedal. Uh -huh. Now, if you think before that time, drums had been like one guy on the bass drum, another guy on the snare drum, and another guy on the cymbals or the 16th notes, three guys. Now, the bass drum was invented to save the band leader money because now he only has to hire one guy who can play the bass drum. He's got his hands free. He can play some snare drum too. And hey, I got another hand free. And so he was able to build, basically right there was rock and roll and swing time and jazz and funk and blues was invented by the bass drum pedal, which brought together, not only was it one guy, but something happens when it's one guy playing those three out. It becomes a groove, a one a thing where the different parts of the rhythm 
are all one beating heart. And so that groove became the dance popular music in many, many forms. The, the inst other instruments changed, you know, the, the, the trumpets were exchanged for guitars. The guitars were later exchanged for synthesizers, you know, everything else. But that backbeat, the fundamental four on the floor rhythms invented by Dee Dee Chandler in 1898, a black man from New Orleans invented my instrument and my entire genre came from that man. Amazing. That, uh, that uh, TV presenter you were talking about might have been Anthony Bourdain, who went around the world. Was he Anthony master? Bourdain? I wanted his job. Right. We Still got do. that from... Uh, from, from oh, uh, okay, which takes us to the next BBC oh. show. Yes. The next BBC show was... Um, my watch is talking to me. Um, was uh, I, This one I took to them and presented them with the idea of what is music and why. Why is music the only art form that will literally take control of our bodies, will usurp motor control of our bodies and cause us to twitch involuntarily and right. sometimes induce us to perform lewd acts of overt sexual activity in front of people on the dance floor. That, that makes normally well-behaved humans thrust their pudenda in a suggestive fashion at each other. Only music does that. Shakespeare doesn't do that. Uh, movies don't do that. You know, Tolstoy doesn't do that. Only James Brown does it's that. Like Australian band men. And so why? That's like the Australian band Men at Twerk. <laughs> well, the thing is that I mean, since this is what I do, it's kind of interesting. Why is it that music has this effect on our nervous system? Why right. have we? Why does it? In our, what is its purpose? evolutionarily speaking, as mammals, as homo sapiens, what is it in our life? And um, there, it, I found that there are several, you know, on the BBC's dime, I went around and figured this out. I went to Harvard and talked to, you know, um, um, all kinds of different scientists. I talked to composers and talked to different people to figure out what it is, what's going on here. Uh, first, sex, it makes us procreate. That's a good thing for any species, but also more importantly, it not only joins men and women, it also joins a society. And the archaeology, I went to a cave and looked at a 30,000 BC bone flute made from a vulture's femur. Uh, 30,000 BC, that's 20,000 years before humans figured out how to plant stuff. Wow. So they were playing music before they figured out how to plant stuff and how to keep, you know, all this agriculture, all, which caused the human explosion of population we took over the planet but music was there long before and the archaeologist theory is that because of music which bonds people as a society us 20 homo sapiens bonded with our little tribe and our shared cultural stuff with our musical sing-alongs and we all work as a unit we could kick those five neanderthals out of the fruit tree so music was an evolutionary advantage for homo sapiens and don't even get me started on religion and music with religion. The Lord clearly loves music. Well, we, we were going to go into Bulgarian throat singing, but for the moment, we'd like to look at some of the music. <laughs> for example, um, you've... Come uh, on, let's with, go to the Bulgarian throat music. <laughs> you work with uh, Oysterhead with guys from Primus and uh, Troy Anastasio from Fish, and then also... Uh, the Gizmo Drome, a band that you set up with uh, Adrian Ballou and the British uh, bass player Mark King. Um, and then uh, you're also rearranging police material for some work you're going to be putting out over the next few months called uh, Police Deranged. Not arranged, but deranged. Deranged. It's actually kind of a beautiful circle. You know, I entered the music business as a member of a band playing incredible songs written by an incredible musician named Sting. And we toured the world and had a great time. As a result of that, I got a, you know, opportunities that never would have come my way otherwise, uh, including Francis Coppola would never have called me if his son wasn't a fan of the police. Um, and that, you know, so that great blessing took me through a, a, a terrific journey. And so it was with great joy that I had the brilliant idea of coming back. Cause you know, summer before last where, 
whoever knows which year is what these days. But I went out and I toured in Europe with a big ass orchestra playing music that I'd written film scores. And I'm on the drums and we got a big orchestra and a very cool thing went down really well. But my clever flinty eyed agent said, how about you do some police song? Pasha, no, 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 I said. He said, you want to play a lot more shows? <laughs> yes. And actually, they're pretty good songs. So I, I, at first I was resistant, but then I cracked open uh, some of these songs that I had deranged. I messed them all up. I took the verse here and put it with a different thing, and which for use in my uh, score in my little movie that I made. So I had these versions of police songs and I just took one of them, you know, see if I could get a cooler. And that's it. The obsession hit. And I wrote 16 uh, arrangements of, uh, different, of different police songs um, just to hear them. And some of them, you know, uh, Message in a Bottle is a diamond. I could not crack that. It is absolute. I cannot move it around, change any note of it. I can only find a way for an orchestra to express it as it is beautifully. Other songs, much more malleable. Tea in the Sahara. Oh, I had lots of fun with that and um, creating these orchestral sounds. And fortunately, um, first of all, it, it really reintroduced me, really rubbed my nose in the quality of those songs. Those bass lines are so simple, but sublime, but then also getting into the harmony, the cool stuff that, you know, it really made me wallow, get right into the cool stuff that both of my colleagues had contributed, you know, the harmonic sensibilities of Andy and the complex, parts right. that he came up with but the fundamental power of the simplicity of those bass lines lyrics right. i don't know we have uh, there are going to be three soul singers um uh singing the songs i love those songs but all that other stuff the bass lines the the uh the chords and everything that's really what i'm focusing on but folks like to hear the songs so we're you know i can only replace hey. uh stingo with three soul singers three ladies three mm -hmm. three large ladies um, and I could only replace Andy with a 50 piece orchestra. Well, D-range. Well, it, there's a couple of things that are really important to what you're going to be doing in your future. And they are about you composing operas. You've composed operas before, but there are two particular operatic uh, subjects that you've been working on. One is a, an incredible piece of work all about uh, an inventor by the name of Nicholas Nicola. Tesla, T-E-S-L-A, like Elon Musk's car name, or like the rock group in 1982 called Tesla, the metal band. Um, and then you're doing uh, an opera with Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders called Witch's Seed. But first of all, what made you decide to look at Tesla? I mean, Tesla, this incredible, incredible guy born in 1856, died in New York in 1943, he invented ACDC, not Angus Young and the ACDC from sure. Australia, but alternate current. He was the guy that basically also got wireless electricity conduction worked out. Tell us about Tesla and why you felt it, uh, it justified writing an opera about him. Well, Tesla invented the modern world with the flick of a switch, literally was the modern world born. When we could flick a switch and turn on lights, turn on machinery, turn on everything, uh, that meant the difference between bef then and now, you know, the modern world with everything that we have. And musically, with his relation with electricity, ah, ha, ha, this is the kind of stuff that composers love this stuff. Yeah. And the piece was brought to me, actually semi-formed. Um, by the German National Theater, uh, very fancy, the German, the Deutsche, whatever, you know, you tried to pronounce the name earlier and failed, yeah. I would probably not succeed any better. But it's the German National Opera in Weimar. And right. um, they, were, they were into the subject of uh, Nikola Tesla and were already working with, it so happened, my longtime collaborator, the librettist, the guy who writes the words, um, had been concocting the story. And so, as soon as I came on, we just went for it. And uh, uh, that was, it was supposed to go up this year and got pushed. No, it's supposed to go up last year, got pushed and now it's gonna go up this year, inshallah. Um, and as soon as I finished that, I started on the Italian opera, which is entirely, it's about witches, the witches see, and see being a verb. Yeah, and it's about the persecution of women in that period of Alpine, you know, uh, European, uh, Alps, the history of witch persecutions. And I figured let's get 
some female perspective on this. So I call Chrissy. Boy, did I get some a little more perspective. Chrissy is Chrissy is uh, a genius um, who came up with I you know the idea that we started with was these poor women, these poor oppressed women by mean nasty men. That is not Christie's viewpoint. Witches, yeah, baby, let's have flames coming out, you know. And so she completely turned the whole, you know, persecution on its head. And that's as much of the plot as I'm going to tell you. But Chrissy uh, put a whole new pizzazz into the mission. And she wrote five songs. I wrote the opera, but at certain points, and in any opera, you like to have a song. And I figured that uh, she would be perfect. And she just immediately uh, got right into it grasped the whole mission of it uh and wrote five incredible songs so this is which by about. the way she wrote them with guitar and i hope she likes what i what i've done with the orchestra so this is all coming you've got the te the tesla opera and of course uh Nick nikola tesla invented both the death ray and a vertical takeoff aircraft 300 patents but stimulated so much of as you say without electricity there wouldn't be the kind of electric uh impact of music and in a post-COVID recovery time where people are going to be desperate to be back in a theater, mixing, having entertainment experiences. This is another whole phase of your career, Stuart, where you are melding and blending and continuing this musical uh, adventure and journey that you've been on now for nearly half a century. Yeah, you know, one thing I can tell all of you young musicians out there, it never gets old. It is a strange blessing that after six decades, I get out in the morning, I have breakfast, and I cannot wait to get into this room to start messing around with music some more because I've only had 60 years of it. Um, it. In fact, it gets richer and deeper all the time. And um, an interesting factor, which is probably true of most musicians, is that you were born with the gift fully fledged. The only thing that changes as the years go by is that you get better and more skilled at manipulating it and using it to whatever purpose you want to do. If you want to sing, you can create, you learn how to create songs. If you want to fly, you learn how to write, you know, cool shit for the violins. Uh, you get technique will improve, but the fundamental gift, the fun, you know, the fundamental song in your heart is right there from the beginning. And I know this from going back. I recently discovered my recording magnetic tape from the mid seventies and my home recording attempts. It's right. exactly the music that I would be writing today when I didn't have the tools, the skills, but the same tunes and riffs. Amazing. I mean, look, I can now understand why in 2007, the president of France gave you the Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters. That's a big Fourth deal. Fourth class. Okay. Say that again. Fourth class. Fourth class. Oh. Chevalier des Arts. Fourth class. <laughs> and and just. I bet uh, you're not even fifth class. No, not not even not even in the class. But uh, yeah, I'm a so, knight. So we've got a lot to look forward to over the next couple of years because you'll be doing more television. You'll continue your, your orchestral work. You are developing, uh, you'll be doing uh, more of your oratorio with various symphony orchestras once uh, entertainment gets going. Um, you, uh, you'll be doing the opera with Chrissy, which these five songs sounds pretty interesting. We've had a lot of questions of people asking about what you've done and Will Urban, who was interested in hearing what you said about Gizmodo, uh, Rick Olson we spoke about. Someone wanted to know whether you were going to complete the- Well, one thing I can tell you about Gizmodo, uh, which is that it, A, it's not called Gizmodo, which brings us to my next point. It's the worst band name in history. <laughs> yeah, your, your new band, I love it, Gizmodo, Gizmodrome, 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 G Gizmo drink, Gizmo what? <laughs> It is the worst band name ever conceived. We started out as Gizmo. I would go to Italy every summer and just do something cool because I like being in Italy in the summer. Who wouldn't? Um, and um, I had a, you know, I would play with a, or an orchestra this time, or I'd play with the ethnic ensemble, the Night of the Tarantula that time. And one time I had like got some music, did like a band, kind of a 
prog band kind of thing. And we were called Gizmo. And then one day they called up and said, hey, look, I got some money here. Why don't you make a record of Gizmo? So we made a record and called in Adrian Ballou and Mark King and uh, Vittorio Cosma, who's big, big personality in, in Italy. And we made a record. Turns out that when you go to make a thing, there's 10 other bands called Gizmo. Okay, band name, hell. Band name, hell. What are we going to call this band? I know, Cliffhanger and the Drum Fills. <laughs> no, no, no. Stark Naked and the Car Thieves. No. Um, Evil Edna's Horror Toilet. Yes, yes. <laughs> so as you can see, we ended up with Gizmo Drodo. No, no, Gizmo Dro What's the name of the band again? It's the Gizmo. Gizmo Drome. Gizmo Drome. So here's an interesting comment that was sent in to us by Jay Ahuja that we'd like to read out to everyone that's watching uh, today. Music is enough for a lifetime, but a lifetime is not enough for music. Famous quote made by Sergei Rachmaninoff, the Russian composer. Of what course. You that, Go Rack. Go Rack. That's right. Rack and roll. Yeah. Well, um, Stuart, I mean, we could go on and there's just so much uh, that we could still con continue to do, uh, particularly with uh, some interesting new television stuff that you're going to be doing. Your career has no limits. You really are stimulated by um, some of the stuff that you grew up with, but it's very interesting just observing your creativity and how you are constantly finding ways that you can channel it into productive ways of using your music, your sensibility, your film intelligence, your television intelligence. Um, you're doing what you always wanted to do. Very, very lucky. I kiss the ground that I walk on with gratitude uh, to however I got here, all the people who get it, put me here. It is, uh, you know, I can only be thankful. Well, as Winston Churchill said, if you really love what you do, you'll never have to worry about getting a job. I, you know, my mother-in-law comes to visit occasionally. Oh, yeah. And uh, and when I, you know, we eat together and we have a fun time, and then I go back. She's, oh, oh, you're, you work so hard. You're going back to work. I see. And I go, yeah, work. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, it's work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, work. I'm going to work. Another 12 hours in the studio. Oh, my God. How will I make it 15? Yeah, we know exactly. Yeah. Wow, Stuart, I think uh, Tom, uh, we should just check in with Tom because we've been, we've, uh, the runaway train. Overstayed our welcome. No, 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 we've never overstayed with you, Stuart. It's just such a dream. I mean, we've had multiple eargasms just hearing what you've said about uh, everything you've done in music. So, Tom, uh, over to you. How are we for time? I could stay here all day listening to these stories. I, I honestly lost track of time. I can't believe we've run nine minutes over. And honestly, the audience is not going anywhere. So if you all want to carry on a little bit longer, please do so. This has been There remarkable. must be some people that we have not yet trashed. <laughs> but here's a question from John Woderick or Woderick. So interesting and diverse with all of the projects that uh, John says he feels bad even asking questions in light of so many of the cool things uh, you're creating. But a question he has is, one, any chances of a police reunion tour in the future? And um, uh, let's see, Chad Petsnick says, uh, the latest Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominations are out. Isn't it a travesty that Devo doesn't get in? Um, uh, what's the latest word on the rescheduling of the police derangements tour? So I guess, People are still in need of police protection. Yeah, the, the derangements tour shows that were this year. Um, we're still looking at uh, October, uh, September, October. Um, many of them are, you know, getting rolled over into next year. Boy, music lovers are going to be in hog heaven because <laughs> every band from the Rolling Stones to Evil Edna's Horror Toilet are going to be on tour. All my music, from the highest to the lowest, to the, all the ones in the middle, are just going crazy. And so everybody will be on tour when, when things open up again. Um, but, and so shall I, like everybody else, but I'll be playing with the orchestras. Um, you know, Vancouver, Atlanta, Nashville, Seattle, Edmonton, uh, LA. 
uh, and also in Europe as well. We've got a string of shows there and they're all kind of getting rolled over as we get to, you know, I think the first show right now is going to be um, uh, Poland in early June. So early June is the first time right now. That might change and it's been rolling backwards all the time but i'll be playing the uh, police derangements uh in poland with the unpronounceable symphony orchestra of chechen poland so so just looking at that deranged uh tour or work with an orchestra you're effectively going to be with these rearrangements that you've done you'll work with an orchestra the makeup of the orchestra is how many pieces, 40, 50, 60? Uh, well, I wrote them originally for 45, but due to COVID, I've been persuaded to trim it back to 30, um, which is still a very cool sound. Very um, cool. So a good string section, horn section. Uh, uh, but you know, I had woodwinds in two, uh, lots of brass and strings out to here. We let the strings. And so I cut it back to woodwinds in one, um, got rid of the French horns, uh, added a keyboard to make up for it. You know, this is the film, uh, all the film composers online here know exactly what I'm talking about. There are dodges to make your smaller orchestra sound fatter. And I'm employing all of these techniques as a hardened, wizened professional uh, to get the most out of it. But it is a, it's a really fun mission though, to go, to walk into the rehearsal. And the cool thing about it, you know, for instance, um, the police to play a police show, we rehearsed for four months. Um, Gizmo, I mean, um, Oysterhead is a different thing. We rehearsed for four days. We're fine because we're just making it up on the day anyway. So who cares? Uh, right. And the, that's what the audience comes for. So they want to see us make right. it up on the spot. That's what they pay money for. They don't want to see some prearranged stuff. Anyway, with the orchestra, I, you know, like in Birmingham, England, I show up at two o'clock in the afternoon with yeah. the Birmingham uh, Concert Orchestra. You've yeah. heard of them, right? Got all their records, right? They're the session players, they're Birmingham session players. It's a, it's a put together orchestra for this sort of thing to play shows. I get there at two o'clock. We rehearse until uh, six o'clock and we play the show that night. And so and is your, is you your, put it on the page, these musicians of the eye, which is so different from rock musicians of the ear. Rock musicians connect with music with their ear. Musicians of the eye, they read the score and they are devoted to faithfully reproducing exactly what they discern to be the intention of the composer. And they know that if they are entirely faithful, that they will be in sync with the other 30 people around them and that collectively they will be the mighty orchestra. And so that's their ethos as musicians is to obey and serve the page. Composers love that shit. And you're, are you on stage with your drum kit playing oh, yes. with the orchestra? So you're right yes. in the middle there and there's still a conductor, uh, obviously yep. the first, first violin leading the string section, but you're effectively playing and, um, and melding in with the orchestral mosaic. Yeah, playing very quietly, um, but don't let that put you off. It's actually the drums, you know, because the orchestra, even though there's a hundred of them, are a quarter or less of the volume of one Fender twin <laughs> rock band, against an orchestra, the orchestra, the orchestra haven't got a chance. The rock guitarist just goes, I go to 11. <laughs> um, and that's it for the orchestra. And so with the drums, which are designed to compete with them, those darn guitarists with their Marshall stacks, that's what yeah, the yeah. instrument is designed for, to you know compete with that. So when I get in there with an acoustic orchestra and um, I've got a, tone it down because I normally wouldn't care because on the drums I turn into an animal but then that small part of my brain which actually wrote that little oboe melody that I rather like yeah. I want to hear it so Is that does a... impose some discipline on the thrashing and bashing um and Chad one Pitt. time Chad one Pitt. time just one last little little point here and then we can let your folks go one time with when I was playing with the the new west symphony here in california and uh they were talking about so when's the sound check oh there's no sound check what do you mean no sound check we I, I, well take a look at the state do you see any microphones yeah. do you see a pa <laughs> do you see any electronics at all wow think of it 60 guys walk out onto the stage men and women on a wooden stage 
and play acoustically <clears throat> without any gear at all, just fiddles and saxophones and cool stuff, you know. It's okay. actually a very beautiful audio. Because the thing is that you hear, it sounds huge and powerful and enormous. And you don't even realize that the volume, that your ears aren't hurting, but it has all the power as if it was loud. So uh, Chad Petznik wanted to find out if there was a saxophone in the orchestra. And Deborah Lynn, who you mentioned that you work with, sent in a message saying, actually, the composers Ravel and Masorgsky were first putting saxes in but saxes in an orchestra is still rare, but Stuart adds them to the orchestrations and she says, it's a nice glue. Go Deborah. Well, I did that with the police tracks. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. Uh, uh, but with the police songs, it seemed, well, for one thing on there are many songs, Sting, this is the kind of stuff he would pull off. This is what I had to live with. Summon a bitch, picks yeah. up a saxophone somewhere on tour. He's got a saxophone. Five minutes later, he owns that instrument and he's like Coltrane, just because he can't go. I mean, why, you know, what are you gonna do? And so he had a saxophone around his neck at all times when we were recording our last two albums. And so he played a lot of sax parts, one man tower of power. Um, and uh, so some of those police songs actually do have sax parts written by Stingo. Amazing. Well, Stuart, uh, Exactly as Tom Truitt said, we could we could go on for another hour and bring in some musicians and get to see you behind the kit, uh, showing us exactly how a paradiddle gets developed from a little into something yeah. that really, really rocks. But I have to say, uh, today was really a phenomenon being with you. Thank you so much for making the time in Los Angeles to uh, not be in the studio, but to be with us and the smartest people in the room. Uh, Tom, uh, I'm sure you'd like to say something to Stuart because you really did create something today that gave people who are watching, listening, not only in the United States, but all over the world to tune in to the smartest people in the room, a sense of what it takes to have the heart of a musician, the brain of a musical drummer, and the emotion of a sexologist knowing exactly <laughs> how to get that chord going. Rumpy Pumpy, baby, that's what it's all about. <laughs> From Mozart to uh, to Two Live Crew. Two Live Crew, yeah, you got it, man. Thug Life, here we come. So, Tom, over to you. Well, let me just say, on behalf of the entire audience, both of you were incredibly fabulous today. Stuart, you are a force of nature. I knew you were a genius, but this has been absolutely remarkable. So thank you. And while I'm at it, let me thank you just for the music. I mean, as I said I at the like, top well, of the- Thank you for your attendance. Everybody yeah. out there, thank you for listening. Thank you for caring, for being interested. You know, thank you so much. Right on. I'll let that be the mic drop right there. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. Stay safe. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Stuart.